to the Son of God. Amen. <laughs> Abraham, Mark, and Luke are not liking the way we just did that one for him. Yeah, but, <laughs> amen. Yeah, you see those notes strung together and all that? Oh, yeah, man. Can't believe the songwriters weren't thinking about us when they wrote that. Man. Amen. All right, John chapter 4 this morning. Did not know, honestly, that song was going to be the last song this morning regarding this message. But I'd like to preach to you for a little while from the Word of God about true worship. A lot of stuff going on nowadays in even our circles that gets labeled as worship. And Guido mentioned in Sunday school about shine, Jesus, shine, all that nonsense. You see a lot of stuff that's called praise and worship. In fact, you have whole teams and churches and departments called praise and worship teams. I'd like to throw up right now. Because I've seen some of that stuff. I intentionally watch it. I'll turn on Hillsong once in a while. Well, I, I need a little fill of ACDC. You know, rat, you know mass up with Jesus Christ words on it. I've seen some of that nonsense. I, I do not care who listens to this. Go get mad at me. Scream at your television. Go to YouTube. Put your comments on I don't really care. It's garbage. It's out of the pit of hell. Just because you put the name of Jesus on something doesn't make it praise and worship. It's a joke. When you got women up there, they're wearing clothes so tight you can see through them. That's not praise and worship. You know why? Because it's calling praise and worship to be given to you. And not to the one we just sung about. There's only one worth all honor, all glory, and praise. That's Jesus Christ. Well, he has a confrontation with the woman in John chapter 4. And I know you folks that read the Bible through. More than likely, you've read this more than once. It's easy to get distracted by some of the things that take place in this passage. She's got multiple husbands. That's correct. The one she's with now, the Lord says, that's not your husband. I mean, it's wonderful that she goes back and tells everybody about the Savior. I mean, we, we use that as, hey, she's a public witness. She even says, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. She has some sort of awakening while she's talking to this man called Jesus Christ that he's not any ordinary man. But there's something tucked right in the middle of that that would be very good for us to take notice of this morning. It caught me really hard this last time I went through and read the Gospel of John. So I'd like you to read with me for a few verses. We'll pray and we'll, we'll get into this morning about true worship. The Bible says this in verse number 1 of John 4. When therefore the Lord knew, the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. You've got to read that carefully. The Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus. Isn't the Lord Jesus? He's talking outside himself the only way that he, uh, God can do. It's bizarre, man, the way the King's English is, but it's perfect. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left, Gal uh, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. You know what's really cool about Jesus being wearied? God doesn't slumber or sleep. That's God manifest in the flesh. God is robed in flesh. He gets hungry, you know. He gets thirsty, you know. He gets angry, you know, just like the God of glory does. Well, he, now he's tired. That must be weird for God to get tired. What am I doing in this robe of flesh, man? I can run like 10 bazillion miles in like one second and not have, need Gatorade. But now I'm, I'm walking through Samaria and I've got to go through Samaria because I'm going to have the guys go through Samaria in Acts chapter number 1, verse 8. So I better set a precedent for them to talk to people that aren't their same skin color or tribal religion. A lot of stuff in this, man. The Bible says this is verse number 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. He's not being rude. He's not being crass with her. He's just saying, give me to drink. Women went to the well. That's why when the man goes to bear a pitcher of water before the Lord goes and has the supper, you know that's a weird thing because men didn't go to the well to get water. Women did. You've got to study that out. It's pretty neat. That's how awesome Jesus going to the cross is and how pre-planned it is in the foreknowledge of Almighty God. So there's a woman coming to the well. The Bible says that he says, give me to drink. Verse number 8 says, for his disciples have gone away unto the city to buy meat like Guido went to the grocery store. Why didn't you say to that woman, Guido, nice to meet you? 
Anyway, sorry. Verse number nine. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. He says, well, she, at least she knows the boundaries. Jesus answered, said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith that he give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. <laughs> oh, boy, she's in for a treat. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave, uh, which gave us this well? Uh, gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, spring up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman, answer, uh, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where man ought to, ought to worship. Now, now, he's having a great conversation. Uh, obviously, he brings up uh, the, the husband issue and all that stuff, but look at how it turns. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. <laughs> We know what we worship for salvations of the Jews. Now, Samaritans are half Jew and half, half Gentile, so the, the groundwork is laid there. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the, for the Father seeks such to worship him. You notice how he said the term true worshiper. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I, that speak unto thee, am he. Thank you again, Father, for the morning. Pray your blessing upon our time of this wonderful passage in your book. Father, thank you for the word of a king, inspired, preserved, perfect, holy, purified in every way, every jot, every tittle. Father, please do not let me do disservice to this book today or to your son or to you. Father, true worship is all about you at the center of it. And Father, I pray that you'd help us today to see from your Bible how we can and how I can hone our worship to be more biblically aligned and not to be fooled and seduced by the foolishness of the spirit of praise and worship that's going around now. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Have a seat. I gave you a little bit of the background as we get going here. I usually go to the right. I'm going to go to the left and mess everybody out, man. That's a change-up on O and O, man. That's, that just messes people right up, man. I'd have to say this passage, I mean, there's, you know, the prodigal son is a famous one. Um, uh, Solomon, uh, throughout the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I'd say in the Gospels, this passage has probably been preached in the last 1,900 years. I mean, hundreds of times. And like I said before, there's so much wonderful stuff in here. Uh, you know, the woman with her, her marital background, the Lord's still talking to her. Uh, you go on further, and the disciples even sit there and say, well, we never doubted why you talked to her. I mean, they, they had no doubt about the Lord's testimony, that he was a clean man, had a clean testimony, and he wasn't there to be her sixth husband. Uh, it's wonderful. She goes back and tells everybody in the town, and then they say, you know what? We believe your testimony, but when we heard him for ourselves, and now we believe. And what a wonderful passage this is. But then the Lord sends a scathing indictment right in the middle of it in verses 22 and 23. He goes, lady, you know what? You don't know what you worship. What a way to have a nice evangelistic meeting go and then just drop a bomb in the middle of it. You know what? You're right. We don't have any dealings, and we don't, you don't have any dealings with us. You're a Samaritan, I'm a Jew, and I'm a Jew, and you're a Samaritan. We don't talk to each other, and... You call me a prophet, and that's true, and all that stuff, and I ask you to give me something to drink, and you're here at the well to fetch water and all that stuff. That's wonderful, but you know what? I just want to tell you, you don't even know what you worship. I'd ask you this morning, do you know what you worship? Are you a true worshiper of the God that saved you and bought you? Like I said earlier, and I, I understand we, we, we're not going that way, the big screens and all that stuff. My big screen is the lion behind me. That's my big screen. That's my plasma right there, the lion. That's it. It's the King James Bible. 
Now, I understand you know, people say, well, you can use a screen for good and bad. No, I have enough screen time at home. You have enough screen time on your computer. You have enough screen time on your phone. You have enough screen time. I just want to come where there's nothing but the Word of God. And I want that preached. So this stuff that's going on in our churches, even in our circles where we're trying to drum up interest and, you know, Guido alluded to the drums and all that stuff. The music and the stuff going on is all masked as praise and worship. What it really is is karaoke singing where you just say the same thing over and over and over again, repeat the same course over and over again. You know, at a certain point in time, you just say it so much, it breaks you down and it makes you weepy and makes you emotional. And I'm not saying emotion's wrong, but you know what? You know who likes your emotion just as much as God does? The devil does. You know what that man that came out of the tombs, what he, what he was doing in the tombs all the time? He was crying day and night and cutting himself. He's a highly emotional being and he was full of devils. I'm not saying it's wrong to weep. It's right to weep the Bible way. I'm not saying it's wrong to get angry. It's right to get right, angry the Bible way. But you've got to be careful about being so emotional through this praise and worship stuff that you forget the one you're supposed to be worshiping. You know what it turns into? Look at the musician up there. Look at the light show. I'm telling you, this Hillsong thing, and I don't know what, I mean, the smoke show and the stuff, I'm watching, I think I, call, I called Karen, and Karen came down with her tambourines and stuff. She was, doing, she was doing the Woodstock thing, man, had the big tie-dye stuff, you know, she's like... But you see people in the crowd doing this. Do you know what you're doing when that, well, I'm lifting up holy hands. Oh, shut up, you hypocrite. You are not. You don't even know what that means. Because you've never tracked down all the Bible verses what it means when you lift up your holy hands. Welcome to church. I'm glad you came in. I'll ruin every one of your idols just like I need to have my idols ruined too. And that's an idol, man. You know what they do? And they get the light sticks going. What's the difference between that and Stevie Nicks and Foreigner? What's it, if you walked in there and didn't have the Jesus words, you'd think you were walking to ELO or sticks or some other foolish thing. I'm bringing up a lot of memories from some of you old folks. You're thinking, man, I've got to go home and claim my playlist out, man. This is pretty wild. What I'm saying to you is you're masking as praise and worship. And Jesus Christ tells the lady, you don't even know what you worship. God wants true worshipers, and he wants true worship. He doesn't want this phony stuff. Well, I raised my hand in the air, but I went home with a heart full of idols. Do you think you worshiped God during that service? Well, let me tell you the easy answer. You didn't. You got, you, got, you got shellacked and varnished by the one who really wants your worship, the devil. Oh, no. Oh, no. The devil wants people to go to hell. You're going to hell anyway. You're condemned already. He does blind the minds of them which you believe. Now, I understand. But you know what the devil wants, folks? You know what the devil's going to get in the tribulation period? Worship. What does he show himself to be in that temple? I'm God. Worship me. And they all worship the image and the beast. Folks, you're in a battle for who's going to get your worship. It's either going to be the God of glory that saved you or the devil. That's why the Lord says, man, this is a great evangelistic meeting. He's having a wonderful time with the slave. And the other one says, you know what? You don't even know what you worship. What are you talking about? I just told you we worship this mountain. Yeah, you, you don't even know what you worship, lady. God wants true worship and true worshipers. So let's go through the Word of God some more for just a little. Now, listen, I'm just going to tell you this. Um, there's, there's about 80-something references. And the heart in the crowd just sunk. We're not going through 80 of them, man. We're going through 79 of them. <laughs> now, yeah, you knew that was coming, man. Now, hey, man, we're only, we're only going to go through a few because I think this is the way as I was going through this and examining my own self and examining the Word of God and where we're at just in general is that, folks, this stuff is setting up for Lucifer and his son to take that throne when we're gone. All the, I'm not saying all those people that raised their hands and, you know, uh, you know, and did, you know, they're jiving up there and all this other stuff. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying this is setting people up for the one that's going to get the worship and praise. Who's always wanted the worship and praise. Isaiah 14, I will exalt myself. It started out with, I want to be God. And God says, you ain't God, buddy. I'm God. And I want true worship and true worshipers. So let's start going through the Bible just a little bit this morning. Hopefully make some points that will help you out. Go to Genesis 22, please. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. You guys want to shut the air off, please? Just for a little bit. Haley, I know you despise that, but it's good for you. And that's it. And there she is.
Genesis 22, verse 1 says this, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I, uh, here I am. Now, I'm just going to say this. I'm not going to, you can't teach all this, but the word tempt here is defined for you in Hebrews 11, 17. The temptation that God lays, because, oh, well, James 1 says God doesn't tempt anybody. He can't be tempted. He doesn't tempt. No, the word is tried because your King James Bible uh, interprets it for you. Scripture with scripture, spiritual with spiritual, line upon line. So God's not tempting him like the devil tempting Jesus Christ to do evil. So your cross reference is, is Hebrews eleven seventeen to, to answer that, of, of, of the word tempt there. So God shows up, tempts Abraham says, and said unto Abraham, and he said, Behold, uh, here I am. And he, said, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clayed the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, that's pretty cool, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, and where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Um, Ike, it's you. And Abraham said, my, uh, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. What a great passage for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar, uh, built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You say, why, why are you starting here preaching Genesis? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, man. This is the first time worship occurs in the King James Bible. So I want to start off by saying this. True worship involves getting the thing you love the most out of your life. I'm not saying that Abraham did not love Ishmael. I'm not saying that. But his boy is Isaac. And Isaac is the f one of the precursors to Jesus Christ. We've been looking through it in the book of Galatians. And you can imagine him raising that boy, Isaac, you can imagine spending time with them. And if you know anything, I, I never had a son. I tried to make them sons, but they're not. They're still women. And they, I, mean, I, tried, I did. I tried to make, we're going to lift weights. We're going to smash the balls around. We're going to throw, we're going to get angry. We're going to do things like a guy. But they're still, they're still women. You can't change that. But a father with a son, there's something about that. Now, I don't know if you had a good dad or a bad dad. We're not going to go down that road today. We've talked about it many times before. But there's something about a father with a son, the Lord Jesus Christ and his heavenly father. Think of all the son and father combinations, even bad ones. Solomon, Rehoboam. And he writes a whole book basically saying, my son, my son. Why are you doing this? My son, avoid this. My son, hear the warnings and all that. But now you have Abraham and Isaac, his, his promised seed. Uh, the, the seed, the son of his old age. I've been trying to have Karen give me a son, you know, a picture of my old age, but it's not going to happen. So, but he has one at 100 years old, 9900 years old. And he has Isaac, and God appears one day and says, "You know what, Abraham? Um, why don't you take your boy up the hill?" Mm, okay, I'll do it. Here, here, here I am. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. But what's going on? Well, um, take some fire and a knife with you, and some wood. Well, what are we aiming to do here, Lord? Well, well, we'll get up there. And you get to the point now in the story where that knife is raised and he's just about to kill his son. The Lord says, of course, we know the rest of the story. The angel of the Lord appears and, you know, now I know that you fear me and all this stuff. But what happens here is Abraham is told, if you really love me and fear me, you'll give up the thing you love the most. And worship appears right in the middle of the passage. And folks, there's stuff in your lives, you heard it in Sunday school, there's idols in your heart, there's gods that you have tucked away that nobody knows about, not your spouse, not your preacher, not your best friend in this earth. There's things in your heart, there's things you worship that nobody knows about. And God says, if you want to be a true worshiper of me, you want to really say you worship me, then you got to take that thing you love the most and you got to put it on the altar. That's the first time worship shows up. 
killing the thing you cherish the most in your life. I don't know what it is. It's easy to say money and all the external things, but how about I just love me? How about I just favor me? How about I really don't care about the prayer list? I really don't care about anybody else. I say I pray, but I really don't. I say I witness, but I really don't. I say, I mean, it, you know, it's really, you know, it's just all about me. And God says, well, if you really worship me, you'll take what you love the most and put it on that altar, and you'll be willing to kill it. That's how worship starts. That's, that's a great place to start right there, because you know what? You can't have worship of the true God until you get rid of the other gods in your life, and neither can I. That's true worship. It starts right off the bat. You know what? What do you, what do you love the most this morning? I have no idea. What's the thing that's tucked away in your heart that nobody knows about, that's got cobwebs and a locked drawer and something that nobody knows about, but only you and the Lord, and the Lord says, I want true worshipers. We quote, oh, we worship God in spirit and in truth. Do you really? Did you read the verses before? You don't even know what you worship. You know why? Because you're worshiping something else that you don't even realize is a false God and a false, a false light you got in your heart. And you got to take that thing up the hill. You got to take the fire, the wood. You got to build, and you know what? You got to kill that thing because it's hindering true worship. That's why this church movement is a joke. American Christianity's joke. I'm a joke. Because you know what? I love God when it's all about me going well in my life and he answers my prayers. When it doesn't go my way, I don't worship him. But don't tell me you don't do the same thing because you do. I love God and I sing praises to him when everything is wonderful. But when it's horrible or it just goes askew, I ain't taking Isaac up the hill. I'm keeping Isaac. I'm keeping Isaac to myself. See you later. Okay. See the judgment seat. See the judgment seat. You see, every knee shall bow. I don't care who you are. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not you. Not the church. Not the praise and worship. But Lord, didn't you see me wave my hand back and forth? Didn't you see me play praise and such? Yeah, but you wouldn't give up the thing you love the most. And that's what I said the first time worship really is about. You give up the thing that you, you just can't, you, you won't let go of it. That's why our relationships with Jesus Christ are not where they are. It's because I just want to cling on to that one thing that nobody knows about. And that's the one thing God says, get your wood, get your fire, saddle the ass, and let's go up the hill. But Lord, really, do you want to be a true worshiper or you just want to show up on Sundays and do a little singing, a little praying? Or do you want to be a true worshiper of me? Jesus Christ said true worshipers. You know, like true vine. We like the true vine and we like all that stuff. And the true bread from heaven. Well, how about we be a true worshiper? It should be quiet because this stuff is horrible for me to go through in my own life because you think you're just a wonderful and great Christian, you know all the Bible, you are not anything like God views you if you can't do the very first thing in regards to worshiping Him. That's giving up the thing you love. I could stop right there, and that would be the end of it. Because if you can't get past this, we're not going to go forward. I'm not going to go forward in my Christian life. But we will go on. Go to Matthew chapter number 2, please. The Bible, something else, man. It's not meant to be heavy, but it is heavy. It's just one, one day we're going to be able to sit there and praise Him and worship and glorify Him for all eternity. And I look forward to that with great joy. And I look forward to having a glorified body and a glorified tongue and all that. But that starts down here, folks. That starts down here. So it won't be such a shock to the system. Well, I'll just wait till he glorifies me. Well, no, he wants you to... The work's begun down here the day he saved you. Look what the Bible says to me in Matthew 2. Verse number 1 says this, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born King of the Jews. Did you see the capitalization of the K, the K there? And did you see the small case K in verse 1? 
For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I would say this as we get going again here. True worship acknowledges and bends the knee that there's only one king, and his name's Jesus Christ. Do you have to work a job? Yes, you do. Should you be obedient to your boss, except when it comes across in that book? Yes, but I mean, let's be real. Do you have a boss that says you can't go street preaching this weekend? Do you have a boss that says, you know, you can't pray over your food? I mean, honestly, I, in America, that's really so rare, it's not even funny. Unless you work for the atheist pipefittersunion.com or something. I mean, honestly. And well, why would you go work there anyway? I want to reach them for Jesus. Oh, no, smart enough, man. Or you drive a Budweiser truck or something stupid like that. I'm just saying is that they, they come all the way from the east. Now, my biblical guess is these boys come from Babylon. You know, astrology and the magicians, all that, they watched the stars and all that stuff. They knew from Daniel's time, and now you're several hundred years down the road. This, they came from the east. The east would be over in Chaldea and Nineveh and all that stuff over here, and they come over to see. So they came from the, we saw his star in the east. That's just a biblical, don't sit there and get it all. I don't like this message about worship because you just said something I don't like. Oh, oh shut up, man. It's just, I'm making, trying to make a point for you to get a little idea of these guys have come a long way. They're probably Gentiles, and they bow the knee and acknowledge there's only one king, capital K, Jesus Christ. He's a baby. Yeah, we're going to find out he's two years old, but you know what they say? We believe he's the one that runs everything, not Herod the little K. Every day you and I battle with who's going to run the show in your life. Every day we bow the knee to something or somebody or someone other than Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean you have to be belligerent to your family or be a bad testimony at your workplace because I'm a Christian. You do No, it's the exact opposite. In fact, when he's confronted by Pilate, he says, are you the king of the Jews? What does Jesus Christ said? What thou sayest? He is the king. He's been the king since he was two years old. But he's willing to say, you know what, my time's coming to be the king. I know I'm the king, but I've got to go to the cross first because there's no crown without the cross. But these boys come and say, you know what, he's two years old, and we know that he runs the show. I'm 55 years old. I've been saved for 38 years. The Lord saved me 38 years ago, and I don't believe he runs the show in my life. You know why? Because I think of the disobedience in my own life and the thoughts I have and the verbs and adjectives and nouns that come out of my mouth, which come from a bad heart. I still do not come and worship him and say, Lord, you're the king. You know, the, the, what we used to say, you know, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You know, one of those goofy things. I get that, lordship, salvation, I understand all that stuff. But at some point in time in your life, you've been saved three, four, five, ten years. You know what? Why don't you start right off the bat and say, whatever he says goes and he's the king. In fact, all, everything I'm bringing is for the king. Don't they bring gifts to him? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh? You know why we're bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh to a two-year-old? Because he's the king, capital K. And he, des he deserves all my worship. A kid deserves all your worship? Oh, he's not, he's not any ordinary kin. King. He's the word made flesh. So what happens is you and I get into a position where things vie for our attention and battle for our attention, battle for everything we have in life. You, you know, we don't talk about giving around here. We don't talk about checkbooks and money and all that stuff. We don't. We really don't. We do have the giving church. We're able to do some stuff for people. But you know what? I heard this from a preacher a long time ago, and it, you know what? I, I want to say it didn't make sense, but it actually does make sense. You can tell a lot about a child of God's life and heart by their checkbook. You know, what's given to certain things. Now, I know you've got to pay electric bill and all this stuff and all this stuff, and I've heard people freak out about, we spend more on pet food on missionaries, but you know what? There is a little bit of truth to that. I know dog food's expensive. I know it is. But how can I not give to the things of God? Well, it shows I don't have a worshipful attitude. Because he's the one that gives me my job and my physical health and the ability to get to work with a car and gas in my car. And he gives me the ability to see things and hear things and have some sort of intellect at my job. And you know what? He's the king of all this. He deserves every bit of it. Well, that's part of worship. If you cannot acknowledge and bow the knee, they're doing this to a two-year-old. You know he's full-grown at the right hand of the Father right now? 
with eyes of flame of fire and hairs white like wool and gird about the paps down of the feet and feet like brass they burn in a fire and a voice sound of many waters and out of his mouth proceeds sharp towards you. Right, do you know who he is right now? He, he's deserving of all worship as the king of our lives. Go on with me to Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew chapter 20, please. Matthew chapter 20. Interesting how these are in Matthew. I know they're in other places, but that one is, and this is the book of the king, the gospel that portrays him as the king. We went through that on Wednesday night. Matthew chapter number 20, please. Matthew chapter 20. Now everybody's going to get on these boys. I think these guys, I think these guys have some salt to them. I like it. I like these guys. I like James and John. And mom comes with them. Bible says this in 2020 of Matthew. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, the other on the, uh, on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I, uh, that I shall drink of, to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, we are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup. Boy, James did in the book of Acts. Indeed, drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptized that I baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared to my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. True worship involves you and I having a prayer life that acknowledges that only the Lord can give or not give you what you truly need. She comes with her sons, and the first thing is, they didn't just ask him, can we sit on their right hand on your left hand? The first thing the mother and the two boys do is what? They came worshiping him. You know what prayer is? It's worship. Lord, I have nothing today of my own that will be of any benefit to anybody without you. I can't speak the right words. I can't go to the right places. I don't take the right route to work. I don't do... Lord, honestly, straight up, Lord, I can't do anything today without you. Well, I'll just get my car and go to work and get up and have breakfast. Blah, blah, blah. We, we are, we're too casual with that, starting with me. We're too casual thinking that, well, you know what? It's just like every other day, right? May not be. What was the proverb of the day yesterday? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth the 27th. If you're not reading a proverb of a day, you're not saved. Go repent right now. <laughs> Everybody go back with Benny and read the proverb for the day and come back, man. We quote that verse. I quote that verse. We quote the one in James 4. Where's you know, no, not which will be on the morrow. But do you really believe that? They come and they're asking, a, I mean, honestly, sitting on the right and the left hand in the kingdom, that's pretty huge. They know there's a kingdom coming. They want to be right there. And the Lord doesn't say, these stupid idiots, what are you doing asking me that? I mean, he's like, well, let's start with this. Are you, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? That's not water. That's the baptism of death right there. And James tastes the sword of Herod in Acts 12. And John gets what? Banished out of Patmos. So they're, they're going to drink of it. They're going to take of it. But before that even gets to the, the asking part, it's let's worship the Lord. And part of worship is, you know what? Lord, today, um, would you help me with my kids? Would you help me with my work? Would you help me with my tongue? Would you help me with my pride? Would you help me with my anxiety? Would you help me with my peer pressure? Would you help me with getting my work done on time today? You'd say, well, that's so, so, so simple. It's so simple, but we don't do it. If you're not worshiping the Lord, you're worshiping somebody else. If you're trusting yourself, that is worship of your own self. That's the golden calf in your life, my friend. And right there, the boys come there and say, you know what? We're just going to throw it out on the table with our mom. Would you give us the right hand? But they started worshiping first. Another part of true worship is you've got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't, you know what? I don't want you to be my co-pilot. That wigs me out. When I see a bumper sticker on that, I'm either going to go buy him and get a ticket by the straight trooper, or I'm going to lay back from him. That freaks me out. God is not your co-pilot. He's your car, your brake lines, your tire, your fuel, your steering wheel. No, as a child of God, he's everything to you. But that's part of true worship. You don't even know what you worship, do you? That's what he said to the woman when we started out. Do you even know what you worship? Do you guys know what true worship really is? Well, in this one, it 
it revolves around, you know what, Lord, I need to ask you for everything in my life, that you would guide me in every step and direction and way in my life. That way I know that you're behind it and you're in front of it. One of the cool things about the Lord was, what did he do with Pharaoh? He'd be in front of him, and then what did he do? Wouldn't that be cool if the Lord would do that for you on a daily basis? I understand it's Old Testament Israel, I get it, and I know he dwells inside you, but wouldn't you want, to be, wouldn't you want the Lord to be your buckler and your shield and have him be your rear, uh, as Brother Bert would say, re-reward? <laughs> you want him front and back, man. In fact, you want him all. You know what, Job, the devil says, you know why he's so successful, God, is because you put a hedge around him. I did. You're right. It's my hedge, and I'll protect him. That's what he'll do for you. And he also leads you in places. I mean, can you think of all the places the Lord took those boys? Peril in the sea and possible all perils in the wilderness, and yet God was right there with them. You know why? A worshipful heart that said, Lord, wherever you take me today, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. It starts with, Father, you know what? I worship you today truly because I don't know what's going to be on the horizon, but I want to do and go and say what you'd have me to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians 14, please. I know we were here uh, last week. Back, back again for a second round. First Corinthians 14, verse 23 says this. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, that'd be awesome. And there come in those that are, un, look at this, unlearned or unbelievers. So they could be saved, but they don't know anything. Or they could be, they're just flat out lost. Will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all. He is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now, I know there's no prophets like Agabus. And I, I know that. But the prophet is a preacher, man, that's in tune with the Lord Jesus Christ in that book in the Spirit of God. And when you're unlearned or a, a lost person, the tongues thing is one thing when they come and they're like, aren't you guys, you guys are crazy. They're all gibbering. What's going on here? But then he switches it to prophesying and says, you know what? The secrets of my heart were made manifest today through him that got up and prophesied. And you ought to worship God when the preacher hits you right between the eyes and right between the heart because it wasn't him. It was God that did it. True worship involves saying, you know what? Thank you, Lord, for hitting me today. I needed to be hit. Thank you, Lord. I've got some idols in my heart that need to be addressed. Thank you, Lord. i got some things clanking around. And you know what? There's things I wasn't even thinking was a problem, but you revealed them to me through that preacher. Even though he's a donkey and I don't like him and all that, I want to thank you and worship you because you talked to me today directly. You say, why does that keep going on? Why do you keep bringing it on? Because that's what, we're not meeting here. This isn't Tuesday night Bible study. This isn't just get together. It's church. It's meant to edify and help and rebuke and love you and comfort you to make you more like Jesus Christ. It's not... We want to see lost people saved, but church is for the saved folks to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to go affect people that are lost. But we meet together to get more like Christ, and that involves taking that old coconut with a machete and chopping it, and taking off the sides and the angles and the corners we don't like. And I don't, I don't like it any more than you do. I mean, come on, you read Romans 2, wherefore thou art inexcusable, old man. I have no excuse. Yeah, I'm talking to you right now. Well, I'm uh, aren't you talking to uh, uh, Kylie or Riley, the corgis? Are you no, I'm talking to you, old man. You, old man, you have no excuse for the way you're acting. Lord, that's a little pointed. Yeah, that is pointed, isn't it? Isn't it, isn't it sharper than any two-edged sword? It's supposed to be pointed. But the other side is to heal you and to get you back on track. And when that person comes in and says, it was just like he was talking to me. Haven't you heard lost people say, it was like the preacher was right at me? I remember years, uh, brother, I think Brother Kenny's testimony is, is that our Brother Knox was up in Plainville, right? And he said he thought like, he felt like Brother James was like 
just staring right at him and talking to him, just staring right at him and talking to him. And preaching, no, that's God tunnel visioning to a lost man who needed to be saved. What about the unlearned saved person that's sitting in the congregation going, I don't know what to do. God will use a preacher to talk to you about what's going on in your life that nobody else knows. And I keep bringing that because I know there's stuff. That, folks, honestly, let's just, let's just cut right to the chase, man. You know the seven baptisms. You know the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, don't you? You, you know we're pre-trib and all, you, you know all that stuff. And those are wonderful things to teach. But isn't it really the seat of your heart where the issues are in your life that is holding you back to be more like Jesus Christ? Isn't it really where you live on a day-to-day -day basis with anger and bitterness and wrath and all those things that really affect your relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not saying you don't need to hear about the mysteries. We, we'll get into those, and we've talked about those, and we preached and taught about them. But you know what? You need to examine yourself in the light of that Bible to be more like Jesus Christ. And then you can enjoy the mysteries in the kingdom of heaven. You can enjoy all that a little bit better when you're walking in light as he's in the light. But if you're walking in darkness like the old man does, you're not going to enjoy church or Bible preaching whether he gets up there and preaches all the facts out of his head he can possibly preach to you. That's why, I do, that's why we gravitate towards teaching, because we like the head knowledge. We all do. We all like to have a 10-gallon hat that holds 50 gallons worth of milk, because we all like to have a big head walking out there. I mean, Brother Paul calls me on Thursday night. He goes, hey, man, what about that? I'm like, oh, I'm just holding the phone away from you. You didn't, know, you didn't see that, though, man. No, but I mean, I'm glad you signed the Word of God, but I'm like, it's, that's cool, man, all that stuff. But I'm like, yeah, right, we'll talk about it later, Paul. But, but I mean, it's good to study that. But you know why you, know you want to know these things? To strengthen your walk with Jesus Christ. To kick out those old hobgoblins in your heart. That was two H's, by the way. Try to get hobgoblins and heart in the same sentence, man. You're really doing well. But that's what's going on. That, the, the preacher prophesies. I'm not telling you what's going on with the mark of the beast and oh, cryptocurrency and oh, Bitcoin. No, I'm telling you, you need to be more like Jesus Christ and less like yourself. That, that's, that's what he's saying is that, wow, God is in you of a truth. And what does that person do? He doesn't go, never going back to that church again. He said, the Bible says the unlearned or the unbeliever falls on his face and says, I'm going to worship God for talking to me today. How many of you have ever walked out of here and said, Lord, thank you for dealing with me through Sunday school? or something? I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the other guys that have taught and preached. How many of you ever walked out here and said, thank you, Lord, I needed that? Th thank you, Lord. You know what? You really addressed something. I don't like it. In fact, I'm angry right now. <laughs> I am ticked off. But you know what? I'm glad I'm ticked off. I'm glad you got up in my face about that. Because I needed it. Unbelievers can do that. What about say, folks? That's how God deals with that. Folks, we're talking about true worship. We're not, even pick, we're not even talking about the 86 of them there are in the Bible. We're just picking a few out here. But it all starts with that one in Genesis, getting rid of the thing you love the most. Or else the rest of these don't mean anything. Go with me on 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. Please, 2 Chronicles 20. We're just making a few comments here and there. A couple blurbulations. <laughs> 2 Chronicles chapter 20, please. Second Chronicles chapter number 20, verse 14 says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeiel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, even the king is individually being spoken to by the Lord through the prophet. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. That's, that's, it's Ammon and Moab in verse number one. Don't, uh, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. <laughs> what a great, that must be up in New Hampshire. The cliff of Ziz. And ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. Remember that when we go on in a couple. And all Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord 
worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. I will not belabor this one, but you can figure it out by the passage. True worship, Bible worship, involves letting the Lord fight your battles for you. When the Lord spoke through the prophet and said, Jehoshaphat, Jerusalem, and Judah, you don't have to do anything. The Lord is going to fight for you. Now, I know we're supposed to put on the armor of God in Ephesians 6. I understand that we have a, a, a position in the battle. I understand that. But folks, I'm not, not fighting for victory. I'm fighting because of victory. I already have it. I'm not fighting for the victory. I'm fighting because I already have it. The, I mean, the victories, we're already 16-0 and 0 in the NFL season, except for the Steelers. They're going to be 2-14. and 14. <laughs> we're, I mean... We're already 16 and 0. We're already 162 and 0 with Jesus Christ. I'm not fighting for the victory. I've already got the victory. I'm leaving here. I'm going home to glory. I'm fighting because I already have the victory in Christ Jesus. I always can triumph in Him. I always have the triumph in Him. I always have the victory in Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 2, 14 through 17 about the triumph and the victory and all that. I already have all that, and so don't you in Christ. But I'm still supposed to wage a warfare. But you know what happens when you get downtrodden? Is when you start fighting that battle on your own. you got to fight in the strength and power of your God. Because the battle is His. Doesn't He tell you over in uh, Job 41? Do you remember Leviathan? Oh, that's the dragon. I, I know who it is doctrinally. Put your stupid big fat head down for two seconds. You know what? That was good right there. Stupid big fat head. We're going to put that on a t-shirt, man. Right next to blind Bart, we're going to do that, man. But you go down in 41, I think it's 41, 8 or 9. It says, remember the battle, remove your hand from them. You don't battle against Leviathan in your flesh, you'll get crushed. But I know somebody who already beat him. I know somebody who's going to beat him at the second coming. Oh, yeah, it's my heavenly father. True worship involves you saying, you know what, Lord? I know i got to put in the armor today, but I can't put on the armor without you. Isn't it interesting how at the end of those armaments in Ephesians 6, what does he say? Praying always with all supplication. We like the sword of the Spirit. We like the helmet of salvation. We like the loins the Lord's girt and the feet shall the preparation of the peace and the shield of faith. We like all that stuff, but we don't pray at it and say, Lord, you know what? The battle's yours today. In fact, you've already won it. And then we get frustrated when we suffer, quote unquote, defeat. I'm not talking about being this weird, you know, Benny Hinn walking around. You know, I'm talking about the victories in the Lord, even in shipwrecks and stonings and fightings and perplexities. I still have the victory because of Jesus Christ. Well, that's part of true worship. Jehoshaphat and all of Israel. Can you imagine seeing so southerners that you see them? They just hit the ground. Thank you. you know what's cool? We're not going to read the rest of it. You know what's cool the next day when they go out to battle? Who do they put in the front of the battle? Singers and musicians. You know who's going to play the football game today? The band. You know who's going to be starting center? Center The tuba player. You know who's going to be the quarterback? First saxophone. That's how powerful our God is. He can put the band out in front of an army and say, you guys, you know what? You want to stay at home? Just stay at home. I got this through the, uh, the band leader. Da-na-na-na-na-na-na-na, <laughs> dead, 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 da na, -na, -na, -na. <laughs> I mean, that's you read your Bible and you're like, you know what, thank God for that. I can worship the Lord because of that victory. He doesn't need Dave Brown to be all stoked up and everything. He's like, <laughs> here, let me get your hip for you today. Here, let me, let, me get your, let me get your little blister in your hand from laying pavers and see how you cry like a little girl. The victory in the battle is the Lord's. And true worship recognizes that. Lord, you know what? I got it today. Don't worry about it. Lord, I got this today. Let's go watch this. Let's watch this. It's not true worship, man. The Lord's looking for true worshipers. You don't even know what you worship. You, know, you think you worship, but you don't know what you worship. But let me tell you how to have some true worship in your life. Go on with me, please. We've got a couple more. John chapter number uh, 9. John chapter number 9. John chapter 9, please. Gospel John. John chapter number 9. 
You remember this account of the, of the man who was born blind, and he is healed by the Lord. I want to read a little bit, and then we'll, we'll make some comment, and we'll move on. Verse number 24 says this, 924, then again called they the man that was blind and sent him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're trying to separate God and Jesus Christ. Gee, I wonder what religions do that nowadays. Bible says this, verse 25, he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know that I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How open he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and he did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple. But we went to Tennessee Temple. I mean, sorry, but we went, but we, I did not pick, I just the one that rolled in my head and my mind, or whatever you want to pick, man. Uh, we're not following Jesus. We be Moses' disciples. Who do you think appeared to Moses in the bush, fool? The God of glory standing in front of you. Anyway, it's interesting how people cling to religion to not deal with their own lives and their own souls. The Bible says this verse, Moses' disciples, verse 29. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow. <laughs> That's just so awesome, man. We know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. The blind man's given a right back to him. Well, we went to school. Who are you? I don't know. I was a blind guy. Now I see, and this man healed me. Well, did you see my doctorate on the wall? I don't care. I can see now. How about the guy when they start ragging on him? What are you doing picking up your bed? I hadn't been able to walk for 50 years, stupid. I'm picking up my bed. I'm going for a run. I'll see you at the track. They're weird people, man. People are weird. God's right in front of them, but they'd rather have religion and other stuff and hide behind it. Well, you're not a true worshiper, are you? The Bible goes on to say this in verse number 30, 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man uh, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, Thou wast altogether born in sins. Well, who are you to tell us? And dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Aren't you glad he goes to them and they're cast out? Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. Him that cometh unto me I will no wise cast out. And when he hath found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord? I might believe on him. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You know what? A true worshiper doesn't care what other people say. You've got to worship the God of glory contrary to those folks that are naysayers, that are doubters, and that are scorners even amongst you and I as brethren. You take it too far. You're too serious. Why don't you read something else? Why do you memorize so many Bibles? Why do you go on the street? Why do you go to jail? Why, do you, why don't you get involved in the battle and shut your yap? You wouldn't have so much time to revile somebody else. Did you see what they did to this guy? We be mo What are you talking to us for? You're born in sins. Who are you? And you know what the man says? Well, let me just go to the temple. And Jesus comes by and says, what, what are you doing here? Well, just looking for the guy that healed me. Well, if I told you who I am, would you, would, you take, would you do it? I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. This is the New Living Dead Epistles, Dead Sea Scrolls, Linus, Peanuts version. Um, and the Lord says, I then talking to you am he. You are. Well, now I can see. I believe. And he, he worships him. you got to worship him contrary to everybody else around you who's going against you. Why do you do the things you do? Why do you go to church? Why do you listen to him? Why do you do that? Why do you listen to preaching? Why do you listen to godly music? Why do you, why do you hand out those pieces of paper? Why do you do this? Do you get paid for this? Is your church behind it? I'm doing it because I'm a true worshiper of the true God who opened my eyes. And I'm never going back from that because I can never forget the day he opened my eyes. And I'll worship him all throughout eternity. We don't worship no man. Oh, you will one day. You will one day. Why don't you get in practice like the blind man who got his eyesight healed? Lord, who is he? I'm right here in front of you. I believe you're him. 
and he starts worshiping him. I don't know if that guy got saved down the road because you're still in the Old Testament, but wouldn't it be great to see him in glory one day? Hey, you're the guy I read about in John 9. Yep, and I'm still worshiping him to this day. I haven't stopped. Going on 3,000 years now, and I'm not tired of it. And I did it in contradiction to my parents who are in the passage, my family who's in the passage, my religious leaders who are in the passage. I'm just going to worship God no matter what anybody says. That's true worship. We all like to worship when everybody's in the same vein and everybody's, it's just easy. But what happens when you have to stand out by yourself and say, you know what, you guys need to go your way because that's not true worship and that's not the true God. I'm going over this way. That's where it gets dicey because we all like to be loved. We all like to be accepted. You're accepted in the beloved. That's all the one, only thing you ought to be concerned about. And you got to go contrary to the wave of popularity. How come you guys don't have instrumentation? Well, when somebody gets right with the Lord and starts learning how to play the piano, we will. That's on the two people. Don't you sit there and cackle in the back either. Daughter of perdition. You're, we both have keyboards at home. They're collecting dust. Let's go. Be a true worshiper. But why, why, why don't you have all the, why don't you have the hip? Why? Why? Well, that's really, you're really praising and worshiping God. According to who? Have you gone through your Bible and written down, worshipeth, worshiping, worshiper, worship? Wor have you done all those? I have. And I think there's two of them that have anything to do with singing. Cut the internet feed on that one. See, you're suckered into it. You've got you to be contrarian if God told you to be contrarian. You've got to stand out. Because that's what, that's what he said. You know what? I finally got away from everybody. Parents, religion, all that stuff. Now I'm in the temple, and here come, Jesus met with me all by myself. But I had to get away from it. I had to get away from it because they were sucking me down to that whirlpool, that vortex of doom. I had to get away from it. And then the Lord says, ah, now we can talk. And he worships them. Pretty cool, man. I'm not going to go through all these. I want to show you... I want to show you one, and then, and then we'll move on. Exodus 12, Exodus 12, Exodus 12. It's always going good to about 10 and 12, and then you're like, whoa, what happened, man? It's just weird, man. Exodus 12. I just want to show you one. There, there's a ton of these. I would encourage you. I would exhort you. Uh, all kidding aside, you should go look these up. Look at 1227 with me, please. They're, they, they're, they're having the Lord's Passover. They're getting out of, they're getting ready to leave the land of Egypt. Look at 1227 of Exodus. Verse 26, actually. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? And there's why are you doing this ordinance of the Passover? Why are you doing this? Verse 27 says, That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and could deliver the houses. And the people bowed the head. And worship. I have. I, I've got. I've got Genesis 24, 26, 24, 52, 34, 8, 1 Chronicles 29. Matt, I mean, all over the place. The point being with this one, and I, I, I am moving on. I'm, I'm not doing it because we're we're running out of time. We're not running out of time. But you can run this through your Bibles that there's a, a place where worship, true worship of God, involves you face down, or at least on your knees. You know what that is? That's humility. Just saying that word humility just makes me want to be prideful. <laughs> it's like repentance. It's like, yeah, no. Because what's the opposite? Folks, we're not humble. We're not humble the Bible way. If we really knew the Savior that saved us, the God that rescued us, we would never have a prideful bone in our body. If we really see what he's rescued us from, hell, car wrecks, diseases, or getting us through disease or car or surgeries, all that, you, you wouldn't be prideful. I wouldn't be prideful for a second. Doesn't the Bible say he resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble? You know what? When you read all these passages about true worship and worshiping God and all that stuff, everybody hits the prone position or on their knees and says, you're the God of glory. I'm nothing. You know why I bow on your knee? You know what they do? They make fun of Tim Tebow because he takes a knee. He's not doing that to be seen of people. He's doing it to acknowledge that there's one God in heaven, and he's the one that deserves all the honor and glory. You take the knee, or two knees, or face down. Face down is a good one. Face down is a good one.
That's why I like when we sing. There's nothing wrong with looking up. But I, like look, I like looking at a hymnal. I just, something about it. I like looking at a hymnal. You know what it naturally does from my neck? You know what the big screen does? No, don't go get, 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 get mad. Don't go get mad at me. I like the old school hymnal because it kind of puts me in a downward position. I'm not saying we don't look up when we sing or we don't raise a hand and say, thank you, Lord, but we're not getting involved in that foolishness because you know what? True worship involves down, boy. Down. There's somebody greater than you in the room. His name is Jesus Christ. But when there's everybody else that's greater than him in the congregation, in the church, Jesus, Jesus, just have a seat in the back next to the kids. Just sit back there. Uh, no, that's where he belongs. And we belong right at his feet. Uh, John hit his face pretty quick. I'll say this, and we'll move from one to the next one. What direction did the boys go in John 18? When Jesus said, who are you looking for? I am he. What direction did they go? Backwards. Godly reverence, godly fear. Godly, true worship is face forward on the deck. Go with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12, please. 2 Samuel 12. You know that David has had his sin with Bathsheba. Uriah is dead. He's committed murder and adultery. Go with me to 2 Samuel 12. I want to close with this. 2 Samuel 12, there's, there's actually two, two spots, and we'll, and we'll make some comment and then close. 2 Samuel 12, verse 15 says this, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. It's a pretty good thing to do, laying down, face down, fasting the whole night. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. You just lost a baby boy and you're going to worship God? Oh, it's adultery, Mert. Slow down. He lost a baby. And now he's going to go worship God? Then came he to his own house, and when he, uh, went, and when he required, they set before him and he did eat. Then says the servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Why uh, thou didst fast and weep for the child? Well, it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether, look at this, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Interesting, she goes from Uriah's wife to Bathsheba, his wife, after the kid's dead, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son and called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. That's Solomon. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and called his name, and called his name Jed, uh, Jedediah because of the Lord. One more, one more. Go to Exodus 33. Exodus 33, please. Exodus 33. You know what's going on in 32. They rose up and played, made the golden calf and all that. But I want to show you something neat here. Exodus, Exodus 33, the Bible says this in verse number one, And the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought by the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest they consume thee in the way. 
And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on, uh, put on him his ornaments. See, there's Christmas trees. For the, for, the Lord, uh, for the Lord had said unto Moses, saying to the children of Israel, Ye are stiff-necked people, I will, come up in the, uh, I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off, thy, uh, put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the, uh, by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, but far from the camp. And called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went, un, went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone to the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And the people rose up and worshiped. Look at this. And worshiped. Every man his own t- in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, and man speak unto, his friend, uh, speak unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the uh, son of Nun, the young man departed not out of the tabernacle. You say, well, what in the world are you doing here? Did you see how they worshiped in Exodus 33? They worshiped. The cloud descends, and the Lord meets there at the tabernacle. But where does it say the people worship? At their own door. What did David do? when he heard the child was finally dead. He said, now I can worship the Lord. You say, well, seriously, what are you doing with this one now? You can worship the Lord anytime, anywhere, under any circumstance. The Lord's meeting with Moses at the door of the tabernacle. The people see it. This is the people God just said, you're a disobedient, stiff-necked people. When they see the glory of the Lord, they're like, this is the real deal. So they said, you know what? We're not going to go towards the Lord because he said, no, we're not, he's not going to walk in the business. You know what? We can worship right here. Now, that, don't see that as you say, I'm worshiping him home today, YouTube. That's all, I'm talking about a practical thing where you're in your car, where you're at your job, wherever you are. The man, David, just lost a baby. and He says, you know what? Now the kid's... Dead, the child's dead, now I can worship the Lord. David, it's an inf- I know that, but now the Lord has dealt with me, and now I can finally worship him and get back on speaking terms with him. I can worship the Lord, and I should. That's true worship. True worship isn't when I want to, it's when he's worthy of it, which is all the time. It doesn't matter if the kids are healthy and the kids are. It, no, I can worship him anytime, any circumstance, under any situation, and in any place. I can do that. You know how cool it is that God doesn't walk in the midst of you and I? He's inside you. He, this is the temple. This is the tabernacle He dwells in. I can worship Him anytime, any place I want under any circumstance. Does that mean you jump around the hospital when your loved one has stage 4 cancer? No, but I can say, thank you, Father. They're saved. Thank you, Father, they're still alive and not in hell. If they're not saved, give me a chance to talk to them. We don't look enough at the way God looks at things. We, we look for Saturday, uh, we look for Sunday to worship Him. We look for the holy day or a revival meeting or a camp meeting to worship Him. No, true worship is anytime, any place, in your own tent, in your own car, in your own house, or wherever it is, you can do that under any circumstance. David worshiped with a dead baby. Children of Israel were told, I'm not walking in the midst of you. You know what? But we just saw the cloudy pillar, and you're a great God and a great Lord for letting us out of Israel. And we're alive. You didn't kill us with the golden calf people that got killed. Thank you. I'm going to worship right here in the tabernacle in the door of my tent. You say, well, it's a big deal about this preach, because you know what? There's a lot of stuff going on, man, that is not real worship. It's not true worship. It's, it's bathed in the guise of worship, and it's not. So that's just a little... little kind, loving study this morning about worship. I hope it helped you, man. I will say this, and we're not going to go there, but Ezekiel 30, if you have a chance, look at Ezekiel 30, verses 30 to 33 when you get a chance. The Bible says that Israel shows God much love, but their heart is not with me. In other words, you talk a good game on Sunday morning, but your heart could care less if you ever worship God again. Crazy stuff, man. Brother Jonathan, pray for, pray for us if you could this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning and the time we had in Sunday school and this morning's service. And just thank you for just everything that was shown to us and how Sunday school was Amen. Put those in.
comes down that, that hinder us from having true worship, Lord, I pray that you just help us day in and day out. 